Brethren, as we all know, there hasn't been as much progress in the past three or four years as there was in the few years after 1972. And there are really three reasons for this. One is the way the Indochina question came into the picture. It came into the picture first because Joe and Lai said to Nixon in 72, there can be no understanding between us except on the basis of settlement of the Vietnamese War first. And one big reason why Nixon did settle the Vietnamese War was his desire for a new policy toward China. And in that indirect sense, at least, the Chinese did make a contribution to the end of that war. So for a while, the Chinese were lukewarm about the American link because they were worried about their relation to their friends in Hanoi and Phnom Penh and Vientiane. And that, of course, uh, went on until mid-75. In mid-75, however, the American side had a difficulty because of Indochina. And that was that after the fall of Saigon, Phnom Penh and Vientiane, there was a pronounced unwillingness in the United States Congress to do anything that might add Taiwan to the list of countries that would suddenly have a Marxist government. And that has been a most important reason why since the summer of 1975, the United States government has been more timid on China policy than it was before the summer of 1975. An anecdote sums up the problem. In the fall of 75, Henry Kissinger was uh, at dinner with uh, Mr. Habib, who was the Assistant Secretary for Asia, and with someone else. And uh, when this someone else asked him if the Taiwan issue might be settled during President Ford's trip at the end of that year, Kissinger made a sour reference to the fall six months before of Vietnam and Cambodia, which are in the portfolio of Mr. Habib as the Assistant Secretary for Asia. And he said, Habib has already lost two embassies this year. He's not going to lose a third. The, the second problem in relations these days, since 74, has been certain internal developments in the two countries. In the United States, the Watergate affair marks a watershed it's not just that Peking thought very highly of Mr. Nixon, though they did, because they thought he was realistic on the one question in the world that interests them, and that's China. It's also that the, the Chinese were simply puzzled about the lessons of Watergate for the way the American system works, its predictability and the question of how Congress relates to the executive branch. In this respect, they were like many other non-Americans in being uh, a bit puzzled. And even more important, they began to wonder whether the United States was going to be rather quickly eclipsed by the Soviet Union as the leading power in the world. And uh, that fear, as many of you know all too well, has been a preoccupying fear for China these past few years. 
why it hasn't made them more keen for the link with America. That is a very complicated question. It has made them uncertain about the future of their link with America. That's all I will say for the moment. In, the, in Peking, meanwhile, there were domestic developments that threw a shadow over the link with America. To put it simply, there were military men, and still are, who didn't find it all that easy to understand Chairman Mao's idea that America, after its setback in Vietnam, had ceased to be China's main problem, and that Russia had become <coughs> the successor to America, or as Joe and Lai put it to me, the John Foster Dulleses of the world now sit in Moscow. Now, a, as, as you know, military men are not always as quick to change their strategic conceptions as civilian leaders, and I think China's no exception. And there have been grumblings in the Chinese army as to just how fruitful for China this link with America has proved, because they want Taiwan. That's the main unfinished business in the liberation of the PRC. That's the item on the agenda left over from the history of colonialism. And who is responsible for the fact that Taiwan and the PRC are separate, say these generals, not the Soviet Union, but the United States? So there is that, uh, that murmuring in the wings in China on the policy toward America. Secondly, there was murmuring in the wings from the Gang of Four. The, the Gang of Four were not mainly interested in foreign policy. I refer to the widow of Chairman Mao and uh, uh, the Shanghai politicians who <coughs> were close to her, who were dismissed from office 12 months ago. They weren't mainly interested in foreign policy, except that they had a skepticism about the impact on Chinese society of too much dealing with foreigners, particularly imperialists. So they weren't very keen on cultural exchanges, and they threw some sand in the wheels at times. They weren't very keen on expanding Chinese trade too much. And some of their more simple-hearted followers in Shanghai did a bit of sabotage now and then of exports, so that some American businessmen and some Japanese were a bit puzzled to be importing shirts with a few white buttons and a few green buttons, and rolls of silk cloth with ink spots. These were little uh, rather pathetic gestures by certain people to uh, demonstrate that they weren't very keen on trading with the imperialists. So the Gang of Four did make some sniping at the tilt toward America practiced by Chairman Mao and Zhou Enlai. That has come to an end. The point about the military, I think, is the more serious one, and that has not come to an end. But the general issue is that, as in this country, so in China, there did arise certain complexities in domestic politics that made the China-America relationship seem a little more problematic than it had in 1972 and in 1973. The third problem 
is Taiwan. The chief obstacle to the full normalization of relations between China and the United States. Now, in the Shanghai communique of 1972, a certain line of solution to this problem was laid out. And uh, the United States has been slowly fulfilling its pledge at Shanghai to reduce and eventually eliminate the American military presence from Taiwan. At the same time, a number of steps have been taken that seem to cement the relation between the United States and Taiwan. In some military transfers, some political relations, opening up of new nationalist consulates in the United States and a kind of change of heart in parts of the Congress in the direction of a pro-nationalist position. Meanwhile, the Peking government has started to hint that it's not sure that a peaceful solution to the Taiwan problem is possible. To be sure, it's hard to tell, even when you talk directly to them, whether the Chinese leaders are making that as a serious forecast or whether they are saying it only as a way of reiterating that it's their own decision and not a foreign decision how the evolution of the relation between Taiwan and the PRC will go. At any rate, it has not helped American public opinion to hear of Peking talking about the probability of a non-peaceful solution. Moreover, there are many in the Congress, as I found out vividly when I testified there, who have convinced themselves that the Chinese are so obsessed by the Soviet Union that nothing else, not even Taiwan, matters, and that therefore there's no need for the United States to budge on the issue of Taiwan. The effect of that message that some congressmen have received, or misunderstanding if that's what it is, has also not been helpful to the task of normalization. So there have been many uh, phantoms let loose against us taking any action. It said we shouldn't be hasty. Well, I mean hasty after 29 years in accepting that the government of China is in Peking after every major nation in the world, including all the West European allies of the United States and all the East European allies of the Soviet Union, have accepted that the government in Peking is the government of China and have full relations with the government of China. After China's already become one of the part of the triangle of global strategic power. After two dreadful wars in Asia, which escalated from civil wars to something much larger, in large part because the PRC and the United States were hostile to each other, Korea and Vietnam. And after giving the nationalists nearly three decades in which to make good their daily reiterated pledge to take the mainland. I can't see that it would be hasty to recognize the PRC. It's said that 
the U.S. should keep its commitments to Thai Bank? Well, the Shanghai communique is a commitment to, and a commitment that I think made more impact on public opinion than the 1954 treaty with Chiang Kai-shek. But more important, what is the nature of the commitment to Taipei? It is a treaty with the Republic of China. It is not a commitment to the people in Taiwan. The United States was not interested in Taiwan until Chiang Kai-shek, having lost his foothold on the mainland, carried the last phase of the Chinese Civil War to Taiwan. That's when the Republic of China entered the island of Taiwan with a certain amount of friction and bloodshed, as it happened. So the US made a treaty with a party to the Chinese Civil War, which happened to take residence on Taiwan because there was nowhere else for it to take up residence. That's the historical background to the commitment. It's got nothing to do with whether Taiwanese society should proceed as it's proceeding today or in the social system that it has today. It had to do with the Chinese Civil War. And indeed, until the Chinese Civil War arrived on Taiwan, the United States had a clear-cut commitment to accept PRC sovereignty over Taiwan. Let me read what President Truman said on January the 5th, 1950. When Formosa was made a province of China, I'm sorry, the Secretary of State, Mr. Acheson, on January 5, 1950. When Formosa was made a province of China, nobody raised any lawyer's doubts about that. That was regarded as in accordance with the commitments, meaning Potsdam and Cairo conferences. The United States is not going to quibble about the integrity of the position, that is where we stand. On the same day, President Truman said, the US has no designs on Formosa or on, a, or on any other Chinese territory. The US has no desire to obtain special rights or privileges or to establish military bases on Formosa. The United States will not provide military aid and advice to the Chinese forces on Formosa. Well, commitments change. That's one lesson of those remarkable words of Acheson and Truman. But another is that the Taiwan question itself meant nothing to Washington until the Korean War broke out, and the island of Taiwan was considered strategically desirable for a larger American purpose in that region of Asia. A purpose, by the way, which Pentagon officers will frankly tell you today is now superseded. They do not regard the island of Taiwan as basic to their purposes, and the American military are not by and large, as resistant to normalization of relations as the Congress at the moment. So the commitment to Taipei is a commitment to the Republic of China, which is an ideal from the past, which failed to carry the Chinese people with it. It's a commitment to a government that is not the government of the territory that it claims to be. 
Now, it's said also that we shouldn't abandon Taiwan, and nor should we abandon Taiwan. Taiwan is not ours to abandon any more than China was ours to lose in the 1940s. To say that the Republic of China has been superseded as the government of China by the People's Republic of China, it's got nothing to do with abandoning the Taiwan people. In this respect, the Shanghai communique is a good formulation of the problem. The United States said in its part of the Shanghai communique that both Chinese parties in Peking and Taipei consider that there is one China and that Taiwan is part of China, and the United States does not challenge that point of view. In other words, the United States does not have to take a formal position on the question of the future of Taiwan. The United States has to take a position on which government is the government of China. That's what recognition involves. It does, however, have to take up a policy position on what will be its actual conduct toward Taiwan. And there is every reason to think that the constructive relations that the American people have with people in Taiwan can continue in non-governmental ways after normalization. That there can be trade, that there can be cultural relations, and that the probability is that Taiwan will remain a separate entity for quite separate from the PRC for quite a long time to come. Whether it does or not, however, depends primarily not on American policy, but on Taiwan and who it chooses to lead itself and on the PRC. My own guess would be that 20 or 30 years from now, Taiwan will still be essentially separate from the mainland, but it will not be hostile to the mainland, and it will have growing bonds to the mainland, and that the American public will wonder why on earth the Taiwan question should have bedeviled US foreign and domestic policy for 30 years, and certainly that the relation between China and America will go on being extremely important long after the Chinese in Taiwan and the Chinese in the mainland have found their own purely Chinese method of living with each other. In other words, on the normalization issue, what, where I stand is that the U.S. should meet the three points of the PRC about breaking relations with the ROC, terminating the treaty, and withdrawing the last military from Taiwan, and thus accept that the Chinese Civil War ended in a victory for Mao and defeat for, for Jiang. Secondly, that Americans should go on dealing with Taiwan in non-governmental ways so long as it remains a separate entity from the mainland. At the moment, no less than eight of the top ten trading partners of Taiwan 
are governments which have full diplomatic relations with Peking and none with Taiwan. And there's no reason to think American trade will not continue after the de-recognition of the Republic of China. Thirdly, that the US would not do anything to foreclose what the future relation between Taiwan and the PRC will be. Our policy should be to do with how the matter is resolved, not with the goal that the Taiwanese and the PRC may arrive at in their future relationship. In other words, it's in the US interest to see a peaceful and a gradual solution to that relationship, and I think the US should exercise its political and diplomatic influence to see that the solution will be peaceful <coughs> and gradual. 